think for the induction ceremony is going to be the next speaker. And she's written really a marvelous book. Don't miss out on this because the reviews will make you wish that you'd stayed. She's really done the expert work. I've never met, read any book that really covers the topic of swimming history and making it current than what we have here in Lynn's book. So with that uh, brief introduction, I could go into her whole resume about being 2020 correspondent and doing documentaries and winning Emmys and all that type of stuff. So I won't even mention those things. Here's the author of this fantastic book, and I'm proud to say a really good swimmer and fun to swim with, Lynn Shear, and her book, Swim, Why We Love Water. I'm fun to swim with. What he means is it was fun for us to be out in the water together and he would look back and see me far in the distance. So it made him feel good that I was dragging behind him. Uh, but the truth is that um, I, I couldn't have done the book without Bruce because this, this wonderful, um, th this, this museum is in fact a treasure and we all need to support it. And when I needed to go to one central place to get some information, this was the place, and Bruce was as generous and as welcoming and as warm as you all know him to be. So I am most grateful to Bruce and to the International Swimming Hall of Fame. And of course, having written a book is the only way I could get into the International Swimming Hall of Fame. Uh, let me start uh, to tell you a little bit about my book and why I did this. And I want to start with a cartoon, and it's a cartoon from the New Yorker, and it's a cartoon of a, a, a round fish bowl, probably something like you might have had when you were a child. And um, towards the bottom, looking up very frightened, are two baby fish. And then over on the left, also looking up, is a mama fish, not looking happy. And up on top, what they're looking at is the daddy fish, and he is flipped over and his fins are pointing north, but he has a big smile on his face. And the, ma the mama fish is talking, and the caption reads, Please, Al, you know the backstroke scares the children. <laughs> so I've put this cartoon in my book because I think that it very wittily captures three of the defining aspects of swimming. One, swimming can be very scary if you don't know how to do it. Two, fish are more like us than we might admit, or vice versa. More on both of those later. But three, when you know how to do it and when you do it right, swimming as the papa on his back illustrates and as all of you know, is the most sublime, most delicious, most exciting activity you can do, at least in the water. <laughs> swimming is in fact my salvation. If you ask me in the middle of the winter or at the end of a grueling day or after a long stretch at the computer where I would most like to be, the answer is always the same. In the water, gliding weightless, slicing a silent trail through whatever patch of blue I can find. Tell me, as the medical world does from time to time, to think of something pleasant and count backwards, and I am back in the drink, enveloped by an ocean or a lake or a turquoise box, carving long and languorous laps that lull me into serenity. At one level, I'm quite sure it is simply sensual. The silky feeling of liquid on skin, the chance to float free, as close to flying as I will ever get. The opportunity to reach, if not for the stars, at least for the starfish. And I should tell you that I was reaching for the stars at one point. When I was at ABC News, some of you may remember, I covered the space program. And I was one of the reporters who lobbied NASA constantly to let a journalist go in space. And this was partly because I really wanted to fly. And it was partly because the astronauts, for whom I have the utmost total respect, nonetheless were not always the most articulate or poetic. So when they would come back from a mission, I, like my colleagues, would run up and say, what was it like, what was it like, describe the feeling out there, and generally the answer would be, neat. <laughs> or perhaps, really cool. Or perhaps, it was good. So I wanted to know what it was like to fly, and we finally got NASA to agree to have a journalist in space competition. I was one of the 40 semifinalists. I was convinced I was going to be chosen, and um, sadly, the competition was ended sometime after the Challenger explosion. So a journalist has still not flown. Um, I'll never be an astronaut, but swimming gets me as close to that zero gravity feeling as I'll ever get. 
Swimming also stretches my body beyond its earthly limits. However, it's also an inward journey, a time of very quiet contemplation. I find myself at peace, able to flex my mind and imagine new possibilities without the startling interruptions of human voice or modern life. I find the silence absolutely stunning. And yes, I am a Pisces. So, as is clearly someone else in the room. Swimming is, in short, an obsession, benign but obstinate. But unlike most addictions, this is one that's really good for us. Every time we grind out our laps, we may in some measure be swimming in the fountain of youth. Its proven benefits, as all of you know very well, read like a wish list from the American Heart Association. Blood pressure, cholesterol, cardiovascular, you know the routine. And of course, it also keeps our aging joints from pounding on the pavement. Alas, it was sad for me to learn in all of this that swimming is not perfect. Because as you well know, you cannot lose much weight by swimming. Too many other things going on, and as was explained to me in minute detail, the more efficient you get as a swimmer, the less the metabolic rate goes up, and therefore, 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 too bad. Um, and also that 1910 YMCA manual that claimed, and I quote, Swimming outdoors prevents the growth of gray hair is a near dream. But as the divine Esther Williams has pointed out, swimming is indeed the only thing you can do from your first bath to your last without hurting yourself. When you're in the water, and here's the great payoff line, you are weightless and ageless. Isn't that what we all want to be? Not to mention, of course, impermeable to the trials of daily life. Annette Kellerman, the great Annette Kellerman, whose beautiful picture you just saw up here on the screen, pointed out that after one dip in the cool, quiet water, and I quote, tired men and tired women forget that stocks and cakes have fallen. <laughs> now there is a campaign <laughs> promise. In fact, of course, water heals every one of our aches, soothes every muscle, I think it's the best full body massage available. It's also the world's cheapest antidepressant. And I'm not alone in feeling this. When a recent poll asked Americans which sport they would like to participate in, every age group listed swimming for fitness, either first or second. And swimmer after swimmer has told me that swimming simply restores their sanity from the world, from their kids, from themselves. The lane lines keep us centered the rhythm of our strokes brings us to our senses. And swimming is also brimming with all of these idioms about our struggle for survival, about striving and thriving in an occasional hostile world. We all use them. Striking out as an iconoclast, you are swimming against the tide. Getting nowhere, you are treading water. Wrong about something, you're all wet. Although I bet most of you would agree with me that that one is insidious. We actually like being all wet. And how many times have we all talked about sticking a toe in, or diving in off the deep end, or finding ourselves in over our heads? It is not just subprime mortgages that are underwater. Life lessons from swimming permeate our society's foundations in everything from the Bible to rock music. I found the most beautiful illustration, um, it's, this one is not in the book, at the Morgan Library in New York, which has all these wonderful illuminated manuscripts. And it's an illumination um, accompanying a psalm from the Old Testament, and it's King David with his curly head, swimming along, naked of course, um, with a harp in the background, and swimming through what is sort of the sea of troubles. It's just the most beautiful, beautiful uh, illumination. <clears throat> and in the Talmud, during those pre-liberated eons, a Jewish father is instructed to do several things for his son. Circumcise him, teach him Torah, find him a wife, teach him a trade, and teach him how to swim. It's right there in the Talmud. And that's been interpreted not only to save the son, of course it was only about sons, not daughters in those days, but we'll overlook that for the moment. Not only to save him from drowning, but also how to take care of oneself. In other words, swimming was considered a basic skill to get through life. And the same point is made to Muslims by a major advisor to Muhammad. 
More contemporary moral guidance comes from the big-hearted blue fish named Dory in the movie Finding Nemo. When Marlin the clownfish gets grumpy, Dory grabs his fin, wriggles onward, and sings, when life gets you down, do you want to know what you've got to do? Just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. And that's exactly what humans have doing, been doing since the dawn of civilization. Swimming was so familiar in ancient Egypt, there were several hieroglyphs for it. It was so embedded in the culture of classical Greece, Plato quoted the well-known proverb that calling men ignorant meant they know neither how to read nor how to swim. When Julius Caesar faced a revolt during his love affair with Cleopatra in Alexandria, he threw himself into the sea and swam nearly 300 meters. Clenching his sword and his purple cloak in his teeth, his papers held high above his head. It was a one-armed sprint that saved his command and that of Cleopatra. There are images of swimmers, as you know well, from going through this wonderful museum <laughs> in everything from cave paintings to Assyrian bas-reliefs, from ancient Chinese bronzes to early Greek coins. Unfortunately, the sport, like almost everything else that was full of joy or reason, disappeared during the Middle Ages, a victim of the overly censorious church and of ignorance that led to prudery. For several hundred years, swimming vanished as Europe disappeared into intellectual darkness. But swimming reappeared with the dawn of the Renaissance, and thanks to a number of popular books, it soon became one of the favorite activities of Europeans. One of its biggest fans was an American teenager working as a printer in 18th century London. His name was Benjamin Franklin, expert swimmer, eager show off. Once at the request of his friends, Young Ben jumped into the Thames River and swam approximately three and a half miles, dazzling onlookers with his skills. And as you know from the exhibit in the museum here, he also invented the earliest swim paddles. He was so talented, young Ben Franklin was, that an English nobleman offered him a handsome fee to stay in England and instruct his young sons. Franklin later surmised that if he had, he might have earned a great deal of money running a swimming school. Lucky for us, he did not. What Ben Franklin found on this side of the pond was considerably less developed. There were very few swimmers among the colonists, virtually no swim instruction back in those days. Of course, Native Americans swam with great skill and elegance, but few colonists took the plunge. One notable exception was President John Quincy Adams, known for taking daily dips in the Potomac at 5 a.m. stark naked. During one of his famous swims, when in fact he was wearing his clothes, a sudden squall appeared, and because he was wearing his clothes and the boat turned over, he nearly drowned. Mrs. Adams was not amused, and the president took up gardening instead. Other presidents, however, were also swimmers. Teddy Roosevelt swam in Washington's Rock Creek in early spring when ice was still floating on it. The very athletic Gerald Ford commissioned the outdoor pool at the White House. And Ronald Reagan reportedly saved 77 lives as a lifeguard before he got political. In 1933, a White House laundry room was converted into a swimming pool so that the polio-stricken FDR could actually get some exercise. More than three decades later, it was bricked over in order to make a press room. And the extraordinary irony here is that the president who bricked over the swimming pool to make a press room was Richard Nixon. Talk about ironies. Today, the tiled pool remains below the press room, empty and unused. And you know that podium where the press secretary or some other member of the administration stands to make whatever important announcement they're going to make? It is located, I promise you, directly over the deep end. <laughs> I told you, swimming is a metaphor for life. And certainly in the modern era, it is very much a part of that life. I know that many of you know the pure delight of going to the movies to watch Johnny Weissmuller and the great Esther Williams swimming through the music and the adventure and enchanting us with their escapades in the water. And how many of you have not seen a Tarzan movie or not lately? Anybody not? Okay. 
I challenge you, go to Netflix, go to Amazon, wherever you go, rent a Tarzan movie. They are just incredible to watch this man swim. Now, he does keep his head out of the water because he's apparently looking out for crocodiles all the time. But um, even so, his stroke and his athleticism is extraordinary. And of course, any Esther Williams movie, as, as we saw um, in Sink or Swim, uh, is worth watching. But here's what's really important to know. Uh, both Johnny Weissmuller and Esther Williams were, of course, actual athletes before they got to the silver screen. As you know, Weissmuller was an Olympian, five golds and one bronze, and Esther Williams would have gone to the Olympics for it, not for the, um, for the war. But they swam their own stunts, they wore their own bathing suits, which is a far cry from much of what we see in Hollywood today. A side note here about my hero, the great Esther Williams. If you ever thought that the reason she got in movies was because somebody figured out it would be really cool to have a swimmer on the screen, forget it. That's not the way it works in Hollywood. Here's the way it actually works. Um, do you remember a, uh, an Olympic ice skater from Norway named Sonja Henny? Great Olympian, medal winner. Well, she was a beautiful figure skater and they brought her to this country and she wound up making uh, movies for 20th Century Fox and they were a huge hit. There were movie upon movie that she made that were just beautiful. So the head of another studio, MGM, Louis B. Mayer, was not happy, and they decided in true Hollywood form that they needed something to compete with the Sonia Henney movies. So Louis B. Mayer, according to Esther Williams, issued a dictum, and it went like this. Melt the ice, get a swimmer, make it pretty. That is why Esther Williams is a movie star because she was off by then in the aquacade because she hadn't been able to go to the Olympics and because they needed someone to do something to, uh, to compete with Sonia Henney. She not over only competed, she far outswam her and she did it with style and skill and always that beautiful, beautiful smile. And then there was that equally talented celebrity, Gertrude Ederle. In 1926, at the age of 19, she became the first woman to swim the English Channel, the 21 miles of egg beater cold water within human tides. Gertrude Ederle was a teenager, 19 years old. Not only was she the first woman to swim the English Channel, she was, of course, the first person to do it swimming the crawl. Everyone else had done it with the breaststroke, and I am always fascinated that the first man to swim the channel, um, Captain uh, Matthew Webb, British sea captain, did it swimming the breaststroke, not only swimming the breaststroke, but with his head out of the water because they hadn't yet changed the breaststroke to make it where your head went in the water. So after all those hours, he not only was exhausted and freezing and hypothermic and all of that, but he had these horrible welts on the back of his neck. Swimming has come a long way. Anyway, this is the, oh, and when Gertrude Ederle got back to New York, she was the star of the largest ticker tape parade by then ever held in New York City. Two million people turned out to see her. She was, imagine that today, people coming out for um, someone who had crossed the Ingalls Channel. Uh, it wouldn't happen. It wouldn't happen. Anyway, this is the heritage of our modern swimming stars. And in a way, it's only natural because the truth is, we were all fish ourselves once, hundreds of millions of years ago, awash in the liquid where life evolved. That is, until somebody, some fish, evolved enough to grow legs that allowed it to walk out of the water and help establish a new line of creatures ranging from dinosaurs to humans. That's exactly how it happens, and in the book I've got pictures of the hardy little fossil that was discovered, and it really is the missing link fossil. It's a fish with a neck, and articulated arms and legs as it walked out of the water. We have plenty of evidence of fish in our anatomy today. The bones in our wrist and our shoulder, just for example, come from fish. And did you know that our ears are modified gill bones? However, given all of that, we were not born to swim. We were born to be terrestrial creatures. So how come we keep going back to the water? We just like it. We just like the way it feels, the way it looks, and the way it is. How do we do it, though? How do we manage to swim through a medium some 800 times denser than air, where you're horizontal, where you need to move all four limbs at once, 
where there is no gravity, as one of the uh, charming swimmers in Sink or Swim put it, we have nothing to push off of, and where you can't always breathe where you want to. No wonder some people are terrified. The answer, of course, the first answer is buoyancy, that helpful miracle of physics that keeps us afloat. Archimedes figured it out when he saw all that water spilling over the sides in the bathtub. It made him realize that humans, like anybody, will glide through the waves and slide through the surf like a cork. Buoyancy is what makes water mystical. It makes us weigh less to feel as if we're flying. It makes us forget about gravity. If buoyancy worked on dry land, it would put plastic surgeons out of business. And it's not only what helps us swim, but it also, as you well know, makes it nearly impossible to drown in most cases. I've said this to non-swimmers over and over. Um, try it. Try to sit at the bottom of a pool. Try to sit at the bottom of a lake. You can't do it. You just can't do it without weights. Of course, that's only part of the solution, and we need to help people learn their strokes. Swimming, I've often said, is the ultimate on-your-own activity. Every other athlete gets stuff to make it easier. Skis, skates, bats, wheels, sticks, gloves, rackets, shoes, even teammates. Not us. An equipment malfunction in the water means some part of your body has broken down, which is why we take lessons and work on them forever. And I must say, one of the great revelations of my research on this book has been how every swimmer I've met, from the beginning beginners to the elite swimmers, are always working on their strokes. Everyone I've talked to has told me that when he or she first gets in the water, those first couple of laps are always getting centered, getting the body right, making sure your, your technique is on track. Um, this, this was a revelation to me. I play tennis, I'm a reasonably good tennis player. I get out on the court, I don't even think about what I'm doing, which is probably why I've never advanced any further than I am. Nonetheless, I just play. In swimming, I now focus on what I'm doing and think about it every time I get into the water. And while the goal may be to slip through that water as fluently as a fish, the modern development of human swimming strokes actually owes more to the frog, the dog, the dolphin, and the butterfly. We begin with the frog, that accomplished little amphibian whose name we've adopted for the leg stroke or the breaststroke. For more than 300 years, the breaststroke was effectively the only means of propulsion that Americans and Europeans enjoyed. It is how Ben Franklin went down the Thames. It is how Captain Webb, as I mentioned, went across the channel. It also happens to be how I learned to swim. Uh, as a little girl in the Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania, I would sit by the side of a lake and I would watch the frog swimming. And I have a really strong breaststroke and a really good frog kick. Curiously, um, it is also how Englishmen were taught to swim in the mm, late 18th, early 19th century. They were told to keep a frog in a bucket by their bedside or by a table. And while they swam, to look while they practiced to look down and do whatever the frog did. I think it seems rather tough on the frog, but it might have been a decent way to learn. So the breaststroke was the first stroke that most people swam in Europe. The next stroke was the side stroke. And of course you flip the breaststroke on the side and voila. Indeed, the side stroke was the racing stroke of choice for English men during one period, and probably English women too, although there are fewer records on that. As for the backstroke, the choice of our little cartoon fish, that wasn't so much invented as described as far back as Renaissance England. But early aficionados dismissed it as too slow, and of course you cannot see where you're going. And it terrifies baby fish. The dog, of course, comes in for the doggy paddle, that primitive human swimming motion that little children do as instinctively as their shaggy pets. In time, the doggy paddle gave way to the more efficient arm out of the water motion, which was first notably observed in the mid-1800s. And Bruce has a great exhibit on that here. Um, the f Native Americans, Native Pacific Islanders, Native people who live near the water everywhere did the crawl automatically, instinctively, they just figured it out. And it was um, American Indian swimmers uh, were observed by the uh, artist George Catlin, Bruce Catlin, George Catlin, 
and ultimately a group of uh, Native Americans was brought to London for an exhibit. The, the, the Brits were very fond of American Indians and they used to bring groups of them over from time to time uh, for living, talking exhibits. And they would dance and they would show off their stuff. And, and they were actually paid for this. This was not slave labor, but the, the English were very interested in American Indians. And they found, one group came over and a British swimming club at one of the famous baths in London called High Holborn uh, found out that the American Indians were going to be in town and they invited them to their club for a, a meet with some Englishmen. And when the Indians took to the water, the British sports writer was so intrigued by the stroke they were using, keep in mind the Brits were still using the side stroke, that he described it this way. They lashed the water violently with their arms like the sails of a windmill and beat downwards with their feet, blowing with force and forming grotesque antics. Of course, what he was describing was what we now call the freestyle. And it was nothing like the breaststroke or the side stroke. And at time of in time, this is the stroke that overtook the swimming world. Why it was first called the crawl is not clear. There are several records on this. On this. Either someone said that, quote, the swimmer appears to be crawling over the water instead of being in it, or perhaps someone else said, look at that kid crawling, or perhaps it was something entirely different and it didn't happen at all. At any rate, this new arm stroke was soon wedded to the new flutter kick, and it became the fastest of all swimming strokes. But it seems nobody's ever satisfied with the status quo, so there was one more stroke yet to be improved upon, and that, of course, was the breaststroke. The dolphin kick added to the breaststroke and was tweaked yet again when the arms were brought out of the water and that became the butterfly. Butterfly, such a delicate sounding name for such a pain producing sport. <laughs> Although of course it is one of the most splendid to watch when it's done well. Anyway, now we have all four, fly back, breast and freeze. Side stroke seems to have been eliminated from official competition. Um, that's what we see, and I, I'm so amused when I go around the country talking about this book and people say to me, you know, we see swimmers in the Olympics and we see the elite athletes and it just looks so easy. And I say to them, and this will not be news to any one of you, it really does look easy. It really does look beautiful. When you see Michael Phelps or Natalie Coughlin or Nathan Adrian or Ryan Lochte or now Missy Franklin going down the pool, you think, oh, I could do that. And what I tell my audience is, no, you can't. No, you cannot. You can try, and you can get really good, but the Olympic athletes are different from you and me. They have different bodies, they have a different mindset, and by the way, they know it. I went um, uh, two years ago, uh, when I met a couple of you for the first time, to the Golden Goggles Awards in New York, and um, Nancy Hogshead was there. Nancy, of course, had already been retired. She took to the podium looking absolutely sensational in a floor-length scoop neck burgundy gown. And she looked out at the very buff assembly of former and current athletes, and she said she loved the golden goggles because, quote, I can come here and my arms are average. <laughs> As she flexed her right bicep, the crowd roared with approval. These are amazing bodies. Swimmers are also different because, well, I've borrowed, with their permission, this wonderful little headline that was on a U.S. Masters website for the book. And the headline goes, you know you're a swimmer if, and some ways that that sentence is ended are, you know you're a swimmer if, you're crossing a bridge and you think, I could swim across this. You know you're a swimmer if people ask you to do a triathlon and you say you would if it weren't for the running and biking parts. <laughs> you know you're a swimmer if you put off the decision to color your hair until after the summer swimming session. You know you're a swimmer if you get in the water and feel like an eagle in the sky. You get the idea. And so do I, which is why I decided to write the book. Not only to write the book, but to participate in a way that was far beyond anything I imagined I could ever do. A little over, oh, about a year and a half ago, when I was deep into the research, I decided it would be a good thing if I did something, well, a little adventurous for the book. Maybe took on an interesting swim. 
I'm a journalist, and all of my life, everything I've reported, I've tried to get as close to as I possibly could to really understand how it feels. So I thought, I'd better learn a little something about this marathon swimming thing. I'd better find out why people are going out into wild ocean water and doing swims that never would have occurred to them long before. It probably didn't hurt that I was rounding the end of my 60s. Mm -hmm. And I thought, if I don't do it now, when will I? Could I push my body and my mind to do something totally new? So I signed up, as Bruce mentioned, for a big swim. I signed up to swim the Hellespont. The Hellespont today is known as the Dardanelles. Um, it's that strip of water separating Europe from Asia in Western Turkey. And for those of you that aren't totally familiar with it, if you if visualize Istanbul and the Bosphorus as being up here, and then the water widens out and it becomes the Sea of Marmara, and then it gets skinny again and it becomes the, the Dardanelles or the Hellespont, and then it empties into the Aegean, and moves on to Greece. But at that point, the little narrow bottom of it is the Dardanelles or the Hellespont. I was attracted to this body of water on several fronts. First, as a former classical Greek major in college, I loved the history. I loved that it was right next door to Troy and that it, the Hellespont had been mentioned so very often in Homer's Iliad. I loved that it was the scene of the most famous swimming myth in Western lore, and that, of course, is the myth of Hero and Leander. Uh, to refresh your memories, Hero was the girl, the Juliet figure, if you will, a chaste priestess of Aphrodite who lived on what was then the Greek or the European side. Leander was the townie from the Persian or Asian side. And, of course, they met and they fell in love. Forbidden love, according to the authorities and to her parents. But young lovers obey no one, and so every night our hero, Leander, slipped into the waters of the Hellespont and swam across to his hero, Hero. She lit a lantern to light his way. They enjoyed a night of illicit passion. Came the dawn, he was back in the drink to swim back home. It all went, well, swimmingly, until one dark and stormy night. Hero's lamp went out, the sea spun, the waves roared, and Leander, unable to find his way, drowned. When his body washed ashore the next morning, Hero took a look, was overwhelmed with grief, and jumped from her tower to join him in the afterlife. It was a double tragedy, but a new theme for centuries of art and poetry. The story of Hero and Leander has been told and illustrated and sung about for more than 2,000 years. In 1810, the English romantic poet George Gordon, better known as Lord Byron, himself a master swimmer, by the way, he had a club foot, was very clumsy and awkward on land, but in the water he swam like a fish. And he was also fascinated with all things classically Greek. So he was intrigued. Could it have happened? Was it possible to swim across those rough waters? On his second try, Lord Byron did it, establishing the Hellespont as a romantic challenge and becoming the poster child for overachieving swimmers around the globe. And that's partly what drew me to it last August. I had also chosen very carefully. It was wide enough to challenge me, but reasonable enough to think I might, might, might make it. Never mind that I had swum no further than a half a mile or so at a time. And just to give you the logistics, the Hellespont at its narrowest point is a mile, point to point. But the, water, the currents are so strong that they don't let you swim point to point. You do a big arc. So it winds up being around four-ish miles. It's never quite clear what it's going to be. I hadn't done anything like that in my life. Some of my strokes were still unreconstructed leftovers from summer camp. I was a lazy lap swimmer in eastern lakes and bays and pools. I had never, ever swum in wild, open water. That is to say, never far from the shore. So I trained, and I trained hard. I joined U.S. Masters Swimming, and I did the drills. I swam at six in the morning, still do, for an hour and a half, a couple times a week. I enlisted wonderful, helpful, generous people like the great Jane Katz and said, what do I do? What am I doing wrong? And she wonderfully showed up at the pool where I was swimming 
and stripped off her clothes and there was a bathing suit underneath and took me for an hour down the lane. I came down here and interviewed Bruce and went out into the ocean with him and picked up a few tips there. I was relentless, I was shameless, I asked everybody I could find that was any good. If you are anywhere near me and you are a good swimmer, or that is to say better than me, I asked for help. Uh, then during the summer, last summer, I took myself into the bays and the oceans and the pools uh, on Long Island. I got used to longer swims. I swam for an hour, for an hour and a half, for two hours, for two and a half. I worked on my technique and I told myself I could do it. Officially, I was in a race. There were 431 other swimmers from around the globe. Some of them, oh, this was the really scary part. Some of them were really good. Um, the, the, it, this was August 30th, so I went to Istanbul first, uh, spent a couple of days to get rid of the jet lag, and then I flew down to this place called Chinakale, which is on the Asian side of um, Turkey. That's where we stayed in hotels, and then they ferried us across for the swim. And on the flight down, of course, it's a tiny town, and it was a small plane, and um, it was clear who the swimmers were and who lived there, so all the swimmers started chattering as we arrived. We were going to be there for three days before the race, and it was, we all started talking, and I met one charming British woman, kind of a round, chunky, sweet woman named Lynn Tetley. She's in the book, not a, from the T family, unfortunately. But we got to talking, and she was very sweet. She's, you know, about in her late 50s. And I thought, oh, this, you know, if she can do it, I can do it. At which point her daughter, her grown daughter, tugged me on the sleeve, and she said, by the way, she said, Mom swam the English Channel. And I thought, oh, God. And then Mom said to me, oh, 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 she said, but I was in much better shape then. I'm not in shape now. I, I was ready to give up from that moment. Um, there, were, there was a, a, a wonderful team of guys from uh, the Netherlands who were there swimming for a charity. There were a bunch of Brits who were out there, a group of them doing their own thing. It was just, uh, they were from Russia, from uh, New Zealand, from Australia, just an extraordinary group of people. Uh, I was getting very nervous, though, as I started to meet them, and I thought, what am I doing here? So the day we got there, um, I ran into the, uh, we had a, uh, a clinic where they were in, uh, uh, letting us get acclimatized to the water, which was terrific, and I ran up to Simon Yuri, who's the head of a, a terrific company called Swimtrek that organized this trip based out of London, and I said, Simon, Simon, there's a channel swimmer here. And he looked at me very patiently and he said, Lynn, there are many channel swimmers here, <laughs> including himself. Uh, I, I was terrified. Um, a few logistics. Um, the current, as I say, is so strong that not only did they have us swim this arc, that they, um, they warned us that if we didn't swim that arc, that we would get caught in the current and be carried way past the goal and into the Aegean. And while I'd love to be going back to Greece at any moment, stuff, I, I must tell you, I didn't want to go to Greece at that point. So I was really good to obey the thing. And then we had reports of critters. There were lots of reports of jellyfish from previous years, which made me very twitchy. Uh, did I say nervous? I must admit that the, by the night before, I was scared out of my mind. Also, in Istanbul, the Bosphorus had white caps on it and was very, very uh, nervous water. It, and that's the water that we were getting. And by the time I got there, it was exactly the same. We all looked out for three days. We looked out at the water in the Hellas Pond every day and said, uh-oh, uh-oh, are we going to make this? I won't go through all the rest of the details right now, except to tell you that on race day, we got very lucky. Poseidon was smiling. The day was sunny and warm. The water was balmy and very calm. The sea was so sparkly, I felt like a diamond in a glittering field. The goal did seem very tiny, and I did feel like a ship without radar. And yes, I did encounter a jellyfish, actually quite a few of them, but no tentacles, no stinging, and they seemed as scared of me as I was of them, although they were so beautiful. They were the big, round, translucent ones, and they were whirling around, and I, I really did feel as if I was on a space odyssey, and I would occasionally on the crossing stop and just watch them. They were quite fabulous. So I stroked and I stroked and I sang to myself and I urged myself <laughs> onward. And yes, finally, I made it. I leapt out of the water to cross the red carpet as the electronic tag around my ankle registered my official finish. 
I flipped up my goggles, shook out my wet hair, and I raised my arms in perfect Olympic form. It was truly a dreamy moment. I had done it. I waded into the water in Europe and walked out in Asia. Crossed the Hellespont in time, by the way, it's a very busy shipping channel. You only get 90 minutes to do it. After 90 minutes, they fish you out if you don't make it. And I made it in time, under time. I did it, I did it in time and emerged on Earth on my own two feet, and I will tell you that no fish creating a new evolutionary line could have felt more accomplished. And as I got out of the water, um, I walked over to where the other swimmers were, and most of them had gotten in before me, but it didn't matter. I was swimming my own race. Um, I, got, I walked over to the group, and I was ecstatic, as they all were. Everybody was elated. And one of my new friends grabbed my arm, and he said, look, Lynn, look up there. And there was this giant leaderboard, like at a golf match, like at a ski meet. And their electronic leaderboard, and it said on the board, Number one, USA, Lynn Sher. And I started to laugh. And then I realized it was my age group. And I thought, oh my God. And then, it, for a moment, I said, will it hold? And then I really started to laugh. I was, of course, the only woman in my age group. <laughs> All of my new friends said I never had to tell anyone when I got home that that was the case. But once a reporter, always a reporter. So there you are. I will tell you, as I say, that was last summer. It was August 30th, and I can still feel the glow. I still smile with pride. It was, hands down, the purest jolt of exuberance I have ever experienced. I was on a high for days, maybe weeks, and I cherish the friendships that were formed in and around those waters. We're all still madly emailing each other back and forth, trying to figure out when we want to get together again. Perhaps more important, I proved to myself that I could challenge my body and push it to a new sense of power. And that is one of the reasons why I swim. And if you look in the book and you see the picture of me with my medal, yes, I have a medal. It is gold colored. <laughs> this is why I swim. And I think the Hellespont is where I truly discovered the Zen of swimming. But as you all know very well, you don't need to travel to another continent to find that out. It's as close as our backyard pools, our lakes, our favorite ocean. And in case there are a few things that you didn't know about swimming, just a word here about some more swimming myths beyond that of Hero and Leander. Number one, there is no way to keep your hair dry. Sorry. As some of you probably know far too well, it is not what bathing caps are made for. Esther Williams made it look easy, but her arrangements are kind of impractical for the rest of us. Her hair was slathered with a concoction of warm baby oil and Vaseline that looked, she wrote, suitable for lubricating cars. Then her hair was woven into braids, topped by artificial braids, pinned up to stay put. I was, she says, as waterproof as a mallard. <laughs> Myth number two, there is no need to worry about how we look in bathing suits anymore. The elite swimmers have bodies we can only yearn for. I tell my audiences to stop yearning. Take a look at some of the pictures in my book of some of my Hellespont colleagues and know that today's athletes are just that, athletes, not models. And praise the fact, I do, that Miracle Suit and some other manufacturers are making such splendid use of spandex that we needn't worry anymore about stray bulges. By the way, did you know that the word spandex is an, um, is an anagram for the word expand? which it does, and then recoils so that you don't. Spandex is great. Myth number three, contrary to urban legend, there is no known chemical that turns green or any other color when it comes in contact with bodily fluids in a pool, unfortunately. <laughs> Myth number four, eating before swimming is not recommended, but it will not cause you to drown. You do not have to wait one hour before plunging in but I think it's better that we don't tell our kids this, better they should digest. Those are some of the myths. Now some encouraging facts, which you all can use as ammunition when you go out there rounding up your folks to swim. Nearly 52 million Americans swim at least six times a year, making it the third most popular sports activity after walking and working out. We are in good company. We splash about in some 10.4 million residential pools and some 309,000 public pools around the country. 
And then there's all those lakes and oceans and ponds. Salt water is, of course, more buoyant than fresh. Cold water, more than warm, both will keep us afloat. And in this election year, an even more encouraging sign. People who swim are more likely to vote than couch potatoes, and even more likely than other athletic non-swimmers. Just for instance, swimmers vote at a rate that is higher than that for tennis players, horseback riders, paint bowlers, and ultimate frisbee tossers. Definitely the group to belong to. I hope this explains to you why I decided to write a book about swimming. A friend of mine flattered me enormously when she said that I, she thought I had done for swimming what Jim Fix did for running some years ago, deconstructed the sport in a, in a very special way. I wanted to explain why we're not so unlike those fish in the bowl, but how we have so many more opportunities to do the backstroke or any stroke. I wanted to share my enthusiasm for the water and the Hellespont and the simple pleasure of sliding into liquid. I know that you understand, and I know that you agree with me when I say swimming is magical. It can also save your life. Thank you so much. Lynn, uh, I know if we have a chance, we can take a couple questions. But first, I want to give you a certificate of appreciation from our from the Hall of Fame for the International Aquatic History Symposium. But also, the thing that struck me, one, is you're telling the story of Huron Leander again. It's the prose throughout the book, which really separates this from any other book that's been written about swimming. And your descriptive prose and even your comments, so many of what you say is, is what brings this to life for me. And the other thing I saw, this, this is a great guide to the Swimming Hall of Fame, because everything you mentioned in the book is in our Hall of Fame. So hopefully this will be a great attraction for us. But uh, I look forward to working with you tonight up on the stage. I think we're going to have a we lot have of fun. fun. And that will open this up to questions. Here's Thank the certificate of appreciation. about swimming, and I think you guys can see, looking at the faces in the audience as Lynn was talking, this is exciting stuff, and particularly the way you, you shared it. I want, to say, I want to say something else, which is, we started a Facebook page, um, and I was always scared to go on Facebook because I thought it was going to gobble up all of my time, and we started, the publisher started one for the book, it's, it's um, I think it's uh, Facebook slash swim the book. And we've just gotten the most extraordinary response. And I also set up an email, which is listed on the book jacket, just for the book. And the stuff I've gotten from people around the country makes me realize um, what an important community the swimming community is. You know, I did a book a number of years ago called Tall Blondes, a book about giraffes, because I have a passion for giraffes. I only write books about things I'm passionate about. And I knew that when I did that, I had tapped into this love for giraffes around the, around the world, as it turned out. And um, I, I hope to have done the same. I, I feel as if the swimming community was just waiting for someone to start bringing it together in a way that Bruce has with the museum. Some of the comments I've gotten make me realize how deeply swimmers feel about swimming. And, and there is a real connection there. Uh, swimmers, you all know, are terrific people. And it's, that's more than, a, than, a, than a, just a pat comment. There is a welcomeness and an openness and a real feeling of, um, of wanting to share. And I think part of it might be because we spend so much time on our own in the water that when you get to talk about it, it's exciting to have that connection. So, um, so I'm very grateful for all, for all of that. In fact, some of you here have mentioned that you or friends of yours have, have been among those who have emailed me. And I've, at some point, I'm going to take excerpts from all those emails and put them on the Facebook page because they're... It, it, what it reflects is how much swimmers care about swimming, and that to me is very important. Uh, I'm happy to take some questions, if there are any. Questions, comments, swimming stories? Yes? Do we have books here, of course? I believe they're books. Do we yeah, have books? I think, uh, are they here or are they out there? I think they're probably out here, but yes, and, and you're going to sign some. I'll books, sign right? books, yep. yes. So let me make sure that, that works. Happy to sign books. 
Yes. I'll hit you with one. The real purpose and lesson learned from the Hellespont is that you can't party all night and swim the next day. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> we did a fair amount of partying. It was, um, it was a great crowd, and um, there you are walking along the, the shore of the Hellas Pond. It's the most romantic place you can imagine. And although I'll tell you something funny, the, I told you Troy is right there. And we went to visit the, um, the uh, ruins of Troy. There's not much to see, but, but having read the Iliad um, and studied it and loving it, loving that part of history, my heart was just so excited to, to be there because you really feel the sweep of history. And you, and you understand where Achilles was and Priam and Hector and, and Odysseus. And it's just, it's so exciting to be there. And um, the joke is that Chinakale, this little town, the main tourist attraction in Chinakale, a tiny little town on the shore of the Hellespont in the shadow of Troy, is the giant wooden horse that was used in the, uh, Brad Pitt's movie, Troy, which was not made in, Ch in Chinakale. It was made in Cyprus. And of course, the Trojan horse never really existed in history. So the big tourist attraction is something that never happened for a film that was not shot there. But hey, talk about romance. It was really good. It was really good. Yes, Jane. I'm looking for another good swim, but I'm, I'm so fussy. I really like warm water. And uh, you know, the channel, I'm just not good enough for the channel, and, and those of you who have done it and know about it, you will understand, I know my limits. But I need a warm water swim, and I need something that I think I can be a challenge. So I'm, I'm open for, I, I, what I would love is to find a really good lake swim, because I also love lakes, and I think I learned to swim in a lake, and I love that crystal clear, I love the lap, lap, lap sound of lake. So I'm looking for a swim. There, you probably know there's a number of companies, including Swim Trek, who organize these swim vacations and swim trips around the world. And uh, I would go with Swim Trek again in a minute because I think they did a great job. But no, I'm looking for a swim. I was thinking about the Brooklyn Bridge, but that's a different category. That's a, less than a half a mile, and it's just for doing, I would all, have you done the Brooklyn Bridge, Jane? Okay. Well, the New York City swims are also great, but now I'm, I'm thinking. I'm, I'm open for suggestions if anybody has a swim idea for me. Great. Thank you all for your being here.